I'd like to pick up where Anna just left off. This idea of scenarios, this idea of perhaps communicating better from the BOE, what is your view on it? Could this idea or this potential recommendations of scenarios, this if this happens, then we get expect this, do you think it would make that big of a difference? I think it will be useful. The question here is how do you deal with uncertainty around the central forecast? At the moment, what the Bank of England does is to publish a fan chart. They have a central forecast, which is sort of a thick line in the middle of the chart, and then uh, gradations of colour gradually diminishing in density around that and getting wider as the horizon goes forward to illustrate uncertainty around that central path. The problem is those fan charts are so wide by the end of the forecast that they don't really serve much purpose. They sort of say, well, two to three years out, almost anything could happen. I think scenarios have the advantage of illustrating what might happen to the economy, inflation, and interest rates if particular risks which the Bank of England is focusing on were to come into play. Right now, you could think, for example, a scenario might be on the upside, sticky or pay growth perhaps more persistent inflation, a higher for longer interest rate outlook. And on the downside, perhaps a weaker growth outlook, which might lead to lower inflation and a faster decline in interest rates. It's a useful way of converting this rather vague sense of uncertainty, which the fan charts give, into something much more coherent about how the major risks might play out. You use that key phrase, how the major risks may pan out. It's interesting because it's coming. This review was initiated to begin with off this kind of miscommunication around really black swan events that nobody saw coming. A pandemic, supply chain shocks, not to mention uh, the story you had in the guilt market as well. I'm curious about what happens when you forecast certain scenarios, but you can't accommodate all of them, does that suggest or even set up the BOE for some sort of lack of credibility or extra criticism around being unprepared for the events that they can't see coming? Well, no, I I think that you would always have scenarios which are based on the risks which you see at the time. And then as the situation changes, you might change the scenarios accordingly. You can imagine, for example, in early 2022, when Russia's invasion of Ukraine was just getting underway, you might at that point have introduced a scenario which had a much bigger, a more extended rise in energy prices and worked through how that would affect the economy, inflation and interest rates. I think that would have been a useful exercise to show that and to make it clearer that when you get a shock like that, um, the scale of the shock can have quite significant effects on policy over a period. And as I said, at the moment, there's, no re- there's not really any way of doing that in the, in the fan chart um, mechanism. I should um, come back to one other thing, though, that doing a review is not just a response to criticism. Expert-led external reviews of central banks, I have to say, to me, that should be a regular thing which you do. The Central Bank of New Zealand does this, an expert-led external re- review, roughly every five years. And the expert-led reviews produce very important reports. The Central Bank then takes on, adjusts its behaviour where necessary. That's a sort of continuous learning process where you're trying to learn the lessons from your own experience and the experience of other central banks. I do very much hope that people yeah. don't view this as something which you only do because something's gone wrong. Um, It should just be a regular way in which the Bank of England and, I would suggest, other central banks seek to ensure that what they're doing is always best practice. It it makes a lot of sense and perhaps setting a precedent uh, for others to follow as well. Michael, I'm curious about where this goes wrong, though. Where does where what are the limitations around these scenarios? Could fiscal policy, for example, be one at a time when a labor victory is expected in the polls but may not be included in the BOE's kind of former forecast? Where do scenarios stop short? Well, look, you you have to recognise the limitations of any forecast, that it's going to be based on certain assumptions, and those assumptions may not hold if the, if the if the situation changes in some major way. That's just the unavoidable limitations of any forecast. So, you and all as um sort of all external users should never take forecasts as being a promise 
or as implying that the only possible outcomes are those which are shown in the central forecast or scenarios. Forecasts are a useful tool. They're a useful tool for policymakers to think about what the policy choice should be and a useful tool to communicate the central bank's monetary policy strategy to households, businesses and financial markets. But of course, there are always limitations. Michael, talk to us then about how the markets get involved here. I mean, there have been so many criticisms, ironically, coming at Ben Bernanke for even inventing the dot plot because of the way the markets use it, not as the way economists intended it to be used. The repricing you're seeing around the BOE just this week alone has been largely Fed-driven as opposed to driven by U.K. economics or U.K. fundamentals at a time when the BOE uses that market pricing or the market expectations as a part of their policy where should markets play a role here? So to say, um, look, the advantage of having the market path for interest rates, is you could say, there's a sort of consistency between the interest rate assumption and other asset prices. The difficulty is that it leaves the MPC producing a forecast based on a market path for interest rates that they themselves may not feel is very plausible. So then the economic forecast is one that's, well, often some and at times, even most MPC members don't think is a reasonable central case for the economic outlook, um, and so I'm not sure what the, you know, what message those kind of forecasts are meant to convey. I do think they need to shift and will shift to a system under which the MPC themselves are making a judgment on what they think is a reasonable path for interest rates over the next three years, and using that as an ingredient in the macro forecast. So then you would have a forecast for the economy, inflation, and interest rates that the MPC themselves think is a reasonable judgment. That I think would be better than the current system of a forecast based on a market path, which the MPC may not view as terribly likely. Now, of course, a forecast based on the MPC's own preferred um, path for interest rates would st you still have the issue that that forecast path for interest rates would change over time. Of course it would. Um, a forecast path for interest rates is never a promise. It's just a best collective judgment at that particular point. And as the situation changes, that forecast path for interest rates itself might change. And you can see markets adapting yeah. to economic news in the US, currently producing a market path which is different to the Fed dots. The Fed dots were done a few weeks ago. It's only reasonable that the market path should differ from the central bank's assumption in light of economic data that comes through. I think you would want that to be the case. It's interesting that you mentioned the U.S. You went right where I wanted to go, which is the story of stickiness in the United States. We are no longer seeing the three major kind of central banks that we watch, the Fed, the BOE, the ECB, all on the same path or even watching the same risks. The stickiness in inflation, this persistence in American inflation, given that the U.S. is the U.K.'s biggest trading partner, what's the read-through into the UK, is there one? Well, of course, the EU as a whole is a much more important trading partner for the UK than the US is. Uh, but you're right to highlight that there are divergences between the central banks. They all had the same broad picture of a big rise in inflation and a marked slowdown. But there are differences right now in that inflation is falling quickly to target in the euro area, also falling quickly to target in the US and a little bit sticky. So also falling quickly to target in the UK and a little bit stickier in the US. The UK is going to be back to 2% uh, inflation. Well, in the April figures, the figures for this month, which will get published in the middle of May. And inflation probably is below the 2% target in the rest of this quarter and probably also in the second half of this year. So sticky inflation in the US I think won't stop the Bank of England starting to cut interest rates in the next few months. Probably not May, I would say June is more likely. Uh, interest rates won't be coming down quickly, uh, but I suspect they will be coming down. 